The October 12th, 2010 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? President Adair. Here. Miss Andrews. Mr. Antelli. Mr. Barker. Here. Mr. Beebe. Here. Mr. Brunson. Here. Mr. Cassetti. Here. Mr. Colby. Here. Mr. Daniele. Here. Mrs. Draw. Here. Mr. Echo. Here. Mr. Esposito. Here. Mr. Gamble. Here. Mr. Gamina. Here. Mr. Haney. Mr. Hanna, Here. Mr. Hyder, Here. Mr. Howland, Here. Ms. Kaylee, Here. Mr. Lee, Here. Mr. Lightfoot is excused, Mr. Monero, Here. Mr. McCann, Here. Mr. O'Brien, Dr. Quattro, Here. Mr. Rocco, Here. Mr. Tucciarello, Here. Mrs. Valerio, Here. Mr. Yolovich. Before we get started to this evening, I would like to welcome back to our legislative chambers, Legislator Aldersley. I think you're back there, aren't you? Yes, she is. She's not listening, but that's all right. Okay, please stay seated now. I would like to introduce the Reverend Alan McKinney of the Greece United Methodist Church, who has been invited by Legislator Richard A. Beebe. be together. Almighty God, who is known by so many names and yet responds to each and every one, I ask your blessings upon these legislators. Grant them wisdom and insight that they may be faithful stewards of the resources of this great county. May they help to find ways that seem impossible to cross bridges and aisles, to reach out to one another, to be supportive, to work together, that we may be of the people and by the people, but certainly blessed by you, no matter how we call. This I ask, knowing that you hear and you respond to all prayer. Amen. Thank you. On behalf of the legislature. Thank you. Good job. They're setting my salary tonight, so I've got a book. <laughs> then you shall. Legislator Paul E. Haney will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Legislator Haney. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You've received copies of the journal of day 10, September 14, 2010. Without exception, the journal stands approved as submitted. There is a hearing loop in place tonight to assist those who are hearing impaired. Anyone requiring assistance should uh, inquire at the clerk's office. If you have a cellular phone, pager, or other electronic device in your possession, we would request that you silence them for the duration of the meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. Legislators, the referrals have been submitted to the legislature for the next committee cycle that are in your folders. This evening, we have several proclamations scheduled. Madam Clerk. Would Stuart J. Mitchell III please come forward? Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and Legislator Paul Haney. Whereas Stuart J. Mitchell III has served as a pillar of Pathstone Corporation for more than four decades, originally established in 1969 as Program Funding Incorporated and then known as Rural Opportunities Incorporated and Rural New York Farmworker Opportunities Incorporated, 
Pat Stone Corporation has been assisting farm workers, low income families, and economically depressed communities throughout New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, Indiana, Vermont, Virginia, and Puerto Rico. An employee of the Regional Community Development and Human Services Organization since its inception, Stuart Mitchell has led Path Stone Corporation as its president and CEO since 1977. And whereas Stuart earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in 1966, and his Master's of Divinity from Colgate Rochester Divinity School in 1970. A 1991 graduate of the Empire State Food and Agricultural Leadership Institute and a 2004 graduate of the Advanced Leadership Institute at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, student, student, Stuart has transformed Pathstone into a highly successful Na nationwide agency that employs hundreds of people. Funded by federal, state, local, private, and faith-based resources, Pathstone manages a vast number of programs, empowering individuals, families, and communities with resources to build better lives. And whereas under Stewart's extraordinary leadership, Pathstone has served more than 30,000 participants, promoting social justice, through advocacy in pursuit of strengthening families' economic well-being. For his efforts, he has been honored with the Civic Award from the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce in 1989, and in 1992 was inducted into the National Farm Worker Advocate Hall of Fame and the Pathstone Hall of Fame. And whereas Stewart serves as an inspiration to all of us for his self-motivation and pers persistence to enhance the lives of those around him. Honored this month with the Pathstone Visionary Award for his 40 years of service and visionary leadership, the life-changing benefits that he and Pathstone have provided are truly immeasurable. Now therefore, let it be known that we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, and Paul Haney, Legislator District 23, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby honor Stuart J. Mitchell III for his decades of remarkable leadership and dedicated service to our community. Congratulations. Congratulations. Just so long, I don't want to say anything more. Uh, first of all, I thank Paul for, for uh, recognizing me and for bringing this uh, wonderful tribute to me and in our organization, Paul and I have known each other for many years, and I certainly want you to know that we work very well with many of you throughout the county in developing affordable housing and providing job training and other services to people in your communities. And we hope we'll continue to do that work for many, many more years. I hope that uh, I will be around for many more years, at least uh, a few more. And uh, again, this is just a wonderful honor. I just a uh, quick privilege, my daughter is here. Anna Mitchell. And my new son-in-law as of June 19th back there, Matt Bain. So hey, that's my name. I have a new son in my family. So again, I'm honored and humbled and greatly appreciative of this, this very special recognition. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Representatives from the Hochstein School of Music and Dance, please come forward. Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and legislators Calvin Lee Jr. and Saul A. Monero. Whereas this year, the Hochstein School of Music and Dance celebrates its 90th anniversary of providing our community with the highest quality music and dance education available. The school was named after a talented violinist born and raised in Rochester, David Hochstein. Presented with his first violin on his fifth birthday, he was almost immediately recognized to be an exceptionally gifted musician. 
under the guidance and generosity of benefactors Emily Sibley Watson and George Eastman. David studied violin at the best schools with the best teachers in Rochester, Vienna, Austria, and St. Petersburg, Russia. And whereas shortly after playing to rave reviews in New York City, Boston, Chicago, London, Berlin, Dresden, and many other cities, David joined the army in October of 1917. Tragically, he was killed in the Battle of Argonne one year later, just a month before World War I ended. In April of 1919, Rochester musicians held a Hochstein Memorial Concert in David's memory. The funds raised from the concert, as well as contributions from Ms. Watson and Mr. Eastman, went towards the creation of the David Hochstein Music School Settlement, which opened in the Hochstein family home on Joseph Avenue to 250 students in 1920. And whereas, quickly outgrowing the modest Hochstein home, the school was moved in 1928 to 12 Holzer Street, where it stayed for nearly 50 years. In 1975, Hochstein became the major tenant of the Central Presbyterian Church on Plymouth Avenue, a building steeped in local history, and eventually purchased it for $1 in 1978. Renovations, capital improvement <coughs> projects, and the opening of the performance hall at Hochstein have solidified the iconic building as the permanent home of the Hochstein School of Music and Dance. And whereas in 1976, Hochstein was awarded accreditation by the prestigious National Association of Schools of Music, one of only 13 schools nationwide to hold this honor. By partnering with the community, Hochstein has created an environment that nurtures and encourages personal achievement by instituting a policy to admit anyone, regardless of their financial resources, and creating an atmosphere that inspires and challenges every student to reach their highest potential. Now, therefore, let it be known that we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, Calvin Lee, Jr., Assistant Democratic Leader, and Saul A. Monero, Legislator District 29, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby honor the Hochstein School of Music and Dance on the celebration of its 90th anniversary. Thank you all very much. Um, and we do have music classes for adults as well and uh, voice lessons, so if anybody feels the need. But thank you very much for recognizing Hochstein. It's a great institute. Um, it's offered many years um, of creativity and inspiring kids and, and adults. Would representatives from Rochester Fire Department Engine 5 please come forward. Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and legislators Cynthia Cayley, Richard A. Beebe, C. Stephen Eckel, and Willie Joe Lightfoot. Whereas, in the late 1800s, the City of Rochester's Hose Company No. 5 and Steamer Company No. 5 were joined together to form Engine 5. For 125 years, Engine 5 has been diligently serving the residents of the Lyle Otis neighborhood. And whereas, known as the Fighting Fives, the firefighters, led by Captain Scott Georgia, are housed at 450 Lyle Avenue in a historical structure built in 1866. Home to Engine 5 since 1966, the City of Rochester invested money and resources into restoring the building to its former glory, finishing just in time for the 125th anniversary celebration of Engine 5 this past August. And whereas all members of the Rochester Fire Department exhibit great bravery and heroism when they enter burning buildings to rescue those trapped in the most dangerous of situations. The willingness of these firefighters to put themselves in harm's way in order to save the lives of others is worthy of highest praise and commendation. 
and whereas the firefighters of Engine 5 of the Rochester Fire Department continue to demonstrate incredible strength of character, duty, and selfless dedication to the safety of our community. We remain forever grateful to all firefighters, past and present, for their courageous efforts. Now, therefore, let it be known that we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, Cynthia Cayley, Legislator District 28, Richard A. Beebe, Legislator District 6, C. Stephen Eckel, Legislator District 26, and Willie Joe Lightfoot, Legislator District 27, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, we hereby honor the Rochester Fire Department Engine 5 on the celebration of 125 years of extraordinary public service to the Lyle Otis neighborhood. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to thank the members of the Monroe County Legislature for recognizing the Rochester Fire Department, specifically Engine 5, for their 125 years of service. Um, I'm particularly honored to represent the Fire Department uh, and have been throughout my career. We can trace our roots back over 150 years. In Engine 5's uh, case, 125 years of continuous service, one of the longest continu continuously operating fire companies in the city of Rochester. Uh, their, their tales of uh, heroism are legendary. Uh, I'm honored to uh, call many of these uh, members my, my friends. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Captain Georgia. And again, I want to thank everybody for this honor. Legislatures, thank you for a great honor. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And also, firefighters, thank you for 125 years of hard service to that community. At this time, there are no formal committee reports scheduled for this evening. We will now hold public forum. We have several people registered to address the legislature. Mrs. Rossi. If you require assistance, a deputy will assist you in approaching the lectern. Please use the center aisle and come forward when your name is called. You will have two minutes in which to address the legislature, and please conclude when the ti timer sounds and exit through the back of the chambers. Thank you for your cooperation. Our first speaker will be James Ramprashad. Please come forward. Good evening. My name is James. My full name is James Frederick Gunsham. Rampersham, and I think when I became an American citizen, was right there. Uh, I used to be on welfare, I used to be on drugs, and I think you all know that, the, the Democrats know that. And, uh, and what I would like to say, Charles Malloy is a good man. He know me very well. He know me at the back of the palm of my hands. And but I do have a meeting with Bishop Matthew Clark. He carries a lot of power. And justice will prevail. I'm a Democrat, and I'm going to have my first vote. And my lawyer name is David Morbido. And I'm going to tell you something. I listen to AM radio. Uh, injustice in the church. I was listening to that in Washington, D.C. And so the Catholic Church is all over the world. I have a $100 bill with, a, with the largest Catholic Church in British Guyana. And if you ask the FBI, they'll tell you who I am. Thank you. 
Our next speaker will be Rita Lewis. Please come forward. I just want to put forth some thoughts. I know we have an upcoming election coming in November 2nd, and I am concerned about some of the statements that are being made, and my concern is where does the poor fit into the whole discussion? And in reality, it should be the poor's concerns and needs that are at the very front of any discussion. Because no matter what happens, we have a real demand from God to take care of the poor. And every single decision we make should affect, or we should think how it affects the poor. So I really hope that no matter what happens in the upcoming election, that when, when it's time to get down to business, the concerns of the poor are first and foremost. And that any discussion regarding taxing the rich is looked upon through the eyes of the poor and who is being affected by whatever decisions that are made. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Grace Miller. Please come forward. Good evening. Can you hear me? I had to come here tonight to tell you that it blew my mind when I read that Maggie Brooks supports Palladino. It was to be expected, but it still was unexpected, and it blew my mind. Here is a man who is proposing to transform some state prisons into dormitories for welfare recipients where they could work in state-sponsored jobs and get employment, training, and take lessons in personal hygiene. Well, he had his nerve saying that. But Maggie Brooks had her nerve in supporting him. His message is quite clear that he has no regard for the poor, especially welfare recipients. What he has said is scandalous. And Maggie Brooks supporting him is scandalous also. I always wondered why Maggie Brooks had the heart to force welfare recipients to bury their own, to bury their own poor at the cost of $2,700 to $2,800 or else be cremated. I didn't know how she could do that. But now when I saw that she supports Palladino, that she has the same kind of heart that he has. I think this policy is heartless, and Palladino alone with Maggie Brooks, or Palladino with Maggie Brooks, is a very bad state for us. I want to say that it is scandalous that Maggie Brooks would support someone like Palladino, even if you support him. What he has said is a, is a horrible statement against welfare recipients, and it shows the kind of attitude and the mindset that he has. No regard for the poor, no compassion for the poor, no room for the poor in their hearts, in Maggie Brooks' heart and Palladino's heart. 
Our next speaker will be Tom Gregory. I am not an official representative of the Board of Elections. I guess I am not an official representative of the Board of Elections. I do two years, two times a year during the primary, during the elections, work as an election inspector. Uh, comments were put up in the Gannett newspaper as of late talking about the inefficiency during the primary election. Most of you legislators are aware that we've brought in a whole new voting methodology based upon uh, law changes that required us to go from the old machines that we had to new machines. The way the article was read in Gannett, or at least the way I read the article, it seemed to infer that election uh, inspectors are not trained, are not, are not prepared uh, to uh, take on the task that they, that they basically confront during elections. My experience over the last 10 years has been that if you ever want to see bipartisan working relationship in actual function, go down to your election site. Because basically you have Democrats and Republicans basically as officers, I believe, of the county uh, working together to come up with a solution. What Gannett seems to have missed in, the, uh, in their article, or at least in this, the bent that they took on this article, is that the decisions that are reached at a, at a polling place are reached bipartisanly. They are reached through contacting the, our election uh, commissioners, going back to a board of elections that is always fully supportive, uh, to even imply or make any impute against the inspectors like myself, okay, and uh, there's a whole bunch of them in this county, that we are not ready, we are not capable, we are not trained, I think basically misses the mark. And especially when we get to a point where there might be an ambiguity, we reach an outcome or we reach a decision on a bipartisan manner. I think that Gannett should maybe laud the, uh, the work that's done by people uh, during the elections. Thank you. This concludes the public forum. At this time, we'll recess the October 12, 2010 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature for the purpose of convening the Pure Waters Administration Board for the Gates, Chilai, Ogden, Seward District. Mrs. Rossi. PWAB 1, referral 10 284, authorizing. <coughs> Moved by Legislator Cassetti, second by Legislator Danielli. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing there is no discussion, all in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Item carries. We will now recess the Gates, Charlie Ogden, Sewer District and adjourn the Pure Waters Administration Board. The October 12, 2010 meeting of the legislature is convened. We will proceed with the considerations of local law. Will the clerk please read the first item on the agenda? Item number one, referral 10-265, amending local law number one of 2001. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Hanna. This is for introductory purposes only. Next item. Item number two, referral 10-265, providing that local law intro number. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Hanna. This is to be tabled. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Item number three, referral 10-265. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Hanna. This is to schedule a public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. We will, now consider, we will now continue with the considerations of motions. And without objection, I'd like to move the balance of this evening's agenda. Do I have a second? No objection from the minority. Okay. And if there's no discussion, is there any discussion at this time? All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Item carries. Uh, is there any unfinished business to come before? Is there any unfinished business to come before this body tonight? Legislator Haney. Uh, Mr. President, if I may, just two quick questions. At the Environment and Public Works Committee meeting, uh, it was promised that the feasibility, engineering feasibility report that was done on the terminal building, uh, that, copies of, that a copy of it would be made available 
uh, to the legislature, and I was wondering when we might expect that, Mr. President. Mr. President, we will have a response uh, at the next meeting of the Environment and Public Works Committee meeting. Thank you. And Mr. President, my second question is I was wondering if the administration could give us any general idea as since um, many members of this legislature have to schedule time to study the document, if the administration could give us any idea as to when the 2011 county budget will be introduced to the legislature. Mr. President, the budget uh, proposal is still being put together, and uh, as soon as it's ready, it will be presented to the legislature. Through you, Mr. President, might that be before the next legislature meeting? Uh, that's to be determined, Mr. President. Thank you. Okay, anybody else at this time? President, Objection, I'd like to uh, move that this honorable body stand adjourned until Tuesday, November 9th, 2010 at 6 p.m. So done.